Cool, do you down? Uh, I'm a uh, Thank you very much for the welcome. Um, yeah, you can, you can probably tell from my accent I'm not from uh, Carmarthenshire. Um, <laughs> I'm at, I'm based up in um, uh, Rhydymain near Dolgellau in Meirionydd. Um, so as well as I was working for the network and farming with with a family in that neck of the woods, um, beef and sheep farm over there. Um, but yeah, it's great, great to be here um, this evening. Um, and you mentioned you mentioned Sorsha earlier, Andrew. Well, this is a uh, this is one of Sorsha's um, hay meadows. Um, if you haven't been there, um, it it is well worth a visit. There's some there's some stunning um, hay meadows um, at her neck of the woods in the Elan Valley. Some of the best <coughs> in Wales, I would imagine. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll just briefly talk about uh, the network. So of who we are, um, what we do, so why we were established in the first place, um, and I'll delve into some of the work that we're doing and, and our priorities, if that sounds all right. Um, so the network, um, it was launched in January uh, 2018. So it's a relatively uh, young uh, organization, new organization. Um, and it's, it's a farmer-led network um, that operates across uh, the United Kingdom. Um, but we've got uh, a steering group in each of the four countries. Um, so we've got 10 farmers who sit on the, on the NFFN Cymru steering group. Um, so they sort of outline the sort of priorities and sort of steer the network in terms of direction of travel and, and what our priorities are. And I'm there to sort of help um, help deliver that um, if you like um, so what what kind of unites us all uh, as farmers really it is um, a passion for, for, for nature friendly farming really um, and, and our sort of ethos uh, and sort of mentality is captured really in, in our manifesto um, which you can find online if you just google Nature Friendly Farming Network. Um, you'll you'll uh, you'll easily find our website, um, and you know th there's no criteria really in terms of, of being a member of the network. You you sign up to the manifesto, um, and we've got a real kind of mixture uh, diversity of farmers uh, within the network. So you know, big, small, organic, conventional, um, livestock. Mixed arable, um, dairy, upland, lowland. So it really kind of captures that diversity that we have in Wales. Um, and we've got around 286 farmer members in total uh, and over 500 uh, members uh, of the public that have joined as well. So you can join as a farmer or you can join as a member of the public. You can also join as an organization as well. So if you're here representing an organization, um, you're, you're, you are more than welcome to, to join the network as well. Um, so hopefully this will be a, a bit of a pitch really to try and kind of sell, sell the network to you guys as well to, to see if we can uh, boost our numbers because I guess the, the more members we have, um, the, more, the more clout uh, our messaging has at the end of the day. Um, mm -hmm. And, and it's free to join as well. Um, so there's, 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 it's at no cost. So um, if you've got any questions about joining or anything, let me know. It's really simple to join um, to join in two minutes on, on the website. Um, so just in terms of kind of why we were formed in the first place, um, some independent research was carried out, I don't know, about five years ago maybe, um, across the UK, um, sort of speaking to nature, friendly farmers or farmers who are so passionate about the environment and wildlife. Um, and from that research and analysis, it, it, it came apparent that there were lots of nature friendly farmers across the UK. Um, <clears throat> but the general feeling was that they uh, felt that their voices weren't um, heard um, or sort of represented in sort of mainstream agricultural debates, um, etc., sort of in the media, and they didn't have 
a platform really to, to express their, their views. Um, so the research sort of showed that there was an appetite to create some sort of network or a movement that sort of pulled all these voices together uh, and have an organisation network that sort of represented future friendly farmers across the UK. So that's that's how it was kind of formed in the first place. And um, you know that yeah, the network is is going from strength to strength um, since it, it was launched um, a couple of years ago. Um, so that's a bit of a background. Um, in terms of of what we do, I sort of think we did sort of three three priorities really. Uh, the first, uh, and not that this is in any particular order, but I think engaging with the public is is a really uh, important aspect of what we do, uh, and trying to gain that public support for nature friendly farming, because you know farming receives a lot of flack from many directions these days um you know it's, it's either the best thing in the world or the, or the, or the worst thing in yeah. the world um and there's a lot of criticism that comes our way um i mean some some of that criticism i i will admit is, is warranted um you know we as farmers we don't get everything perfect all the time and there's always room for improvement um but we do feel that you know, kind of farming in Wales and uh, across the UK is often sort of painted with the same brush as, um, you know, sort of intensive farming, sort of beef loss that you you would see, um, you know, sort of in the states and Brazil and and other um, other countries across the globe. Um, so we we want to highlight that you know there is a lot of good stuff going out there um, and. Whilst there is a conflict at times between farming and nature and environment, um, you know, we, we can get it right. And when we do get it right, you know, it benefits um, the farm and it benefits nature and environment and it benefits the, the, the public and sort of all strands of sustainability, really. Mm. Um, and we do this by sort of attending shows and conferences, etc. So hopefully we'll be at the um, spring show in Bill. Uh, this May, so if, if you're attending, um, please drop by and have a chat. Um, and we'll be at the, at the Royal Welsh show as well, hopefully if all goes well. Um, and other conferences like the, the Wales Real Food and Farming Conference we've attended as well. Uh, we've got a public unit e newsletter that goes out. Um, not sure how, how often it goes out, but there's at least uh, four a year. Um, so if you join as a member of the public, you, you can get access to that. Um, very active on, on social media, um, trying to sort of demonstrate best practice and, um, and, and several campaigns recently. Uh, and we send out surveys as well to our public members to see sort of what they want. Uh, what do they want farmers to deliver, actually? Because, and I'll, 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 I'll talk about more about this later on, but, you know, Farming is heavily subsidised in Wales, um, and we need to ensure, as an industry, I think that um, the public are, are sort of satisfied with with how their um, how their money, how their how their tax payers' money is sort of spent um, on farming, um, and a, a series of, of blogs as well, uh, with some sort of stories from from our members, etc. So that is one one of our priorities. Um, and because we're a network of farmers, obviously engaging with farmers is, is a really important aspect. Um, and we, we try to do this as well as we can, even though we've, we've got a, a quite a small team overall, um, only, only a handful of, of staff that, that work for the network across the UK. Um, but we've got a, we started something up as a knowledge uh, transfer and exchange program. Um, so last uh, month, we held um, some training sessions with um, the Global Bee Conservation Trust, um, looking at how to record um, pollinators on your farm, how to ID them, how to monitor them, and sort of uh, general good practices that benefits pollinators. And, and likewise, we did the similar one with GWCT and, and RSBB Cymru um, prior to that, 
looking at um, how to identify famine birds uh, and how to some hints and tips as to improving their their populations on on, on your farm. So they, they are recorded, um, and um, yeah, if, if you if you if you join the network, you, you can have access to those to those uh, videos as well. Um, we also um, publish practical reports. So our recent, um, most recent report is farming for climate action. What are we waiting for? So that includes um, a, a list of um, activities that farmers can undertake to help reduce um, emissions and sequester carbon on their farms. Um, and doing so in a way that you know, makes the farm profitable as well. Um, and on, on profitability, uh, Nature Means Business uh, report was published uh, last October. And that is all about sort of how nature friendly farming is um, can be the most profitable way of farming. So I'll talk a bit about that um, later on. Uh, and our Rethink Farming cam uh, campaign and report um, shows sort of case studies of how farmers uh, across the network are sort of delivering for uh, farming nature and climate. Uh, we're active on the on the farming forum. Um, we hold farm walks and talks as well. We had a, a mini series last autumn. Hopefully this May, uh, Nature Friendly Farming Week is um, the week commencing 16th of May, I believe. So keep an eye out for some uh, farm walks and talks. Um, I'm sure there will be one in Carmarthenshire and um, yeah, you're all invited and, and welcome to join. We've got a podcast series as well, um, trying to promote case studies as, as much as we can and the farmer e-newsletter e that goes out um, um, six or seven times a year as well. And one of our biggest um, priorities at the moment, because it's, it's very timely really, is influencing or trying to influencing um, agricultural policy so that they so it better support um, and facilitates and rewards uh, nature friendly farming. So building that political support amongst members of the Senate um, to really sort of fund um, and, and reward the type of farming um, that benefits nature and the environment uh, is, is high on our agenda. At the moment, so we'll be engaging with with politicians um, over the over the year with on farm visits to try and demonstrate to them really because a lot of them aren't from a farming background. You know what farmers can do for nature and the environment, whilst also producing sort of sustainable food as well. Um, so we do this by yeah responding to various consultations, meeting with politicians um, and the Welsh government as well, and we're involved uh, on on different government stakeholder group so it's really good to see that the, the network has got that seat uh, at the table when it comes um, to, to sort of um, policy design um, which going back to sort of why the network was formed in the first place it's it's, it's a really positive thing because it kind of gives um, nature friendly farmers a voice um, in these really important debates um, and just just uh, just touching on policy um, now that we're out of the uh, European Union and the common agricultural policy, um, we've got a clean slate really in terms of designing our own bespoke farming policy in Wales. Um, at the moment, it looks like the Welsh government are going towards uh, you know sort of rewarding more nature friendly farming and trying to promote sort of more agroecological farming techniques, um, which, uh, you know, as, as a network we are, we're very happy about, but the devil will be in the detail really in terms of what the payment rates are, what are the actions that are required um, of farmers. So if you're, if you're a farmer and listening in, please let us know sort of uh, what your priorities are for a future policy. We would really like to hear from you to sort of inform our, our various um, policy positions. Um, this is my this is my last slide. Um, Andrew, I don't no idea where we are at the time, um, but 
this um I thought carry I'm on be- as long as you want Reese <laughs> you've got plenty of time uh I thought I'd include this slide because it, it forms a, a central component of I thought almost what we are trying to to push sort of um sort of advice and guidance that farmers are, are receiving also trying to trying to push this in terms of our future policy as well and and it's all around sort of nature means business so nature friendly farming it, the evidence is showing now that nature friendly farming it is the most sort of profitable way of farming um and it, and it's it, it, it's better for the for the bottom line for the farm business um and I, i'll I wasn't going to try and explain what this graph is, but I, I, I'll give it a go. Um, I, I've seen this graph a few times now, and when you look at, first look at it, it, it can be quite daunting uh, and, and, and make little sense, but uh, bear with me. So th- th- there's this concept that is being developed um, called uh, the maximum sustainable output. Um, and the MSO, as we call it, it's it's sort of this sweet spot where farming is at its most profitable uh, and where nature thrives. Um, and central to this really is sort of taking advantage of, of nature's bounty, the, the free issue assets that you have on your farm in terms of natural available grass, um, your soils, your, kind of the natural resources that your farm offers you for free. Um, so if you take a look at this graph, um, you've got the revenue and costs on, on the vertical axis and the output in terms of volumes and sale on, on the, the horizontal axis. Um, and every, every farm has, um, you know, got fixed costs and there are, there are predictive variable costs which is this blue line here, associated with uh, with producing food. So that might be sort of harvesting, you know, silage, getting some sort of contractors in to do some work, etc. Um, and under a, a sort of normal business um, economic sort of model, there is that sort of linear relationship or, or a steady relationship between um, volume and uh, how much you produce and then your your revenue and costs and generally the more you produce um the more money you make or more the more profitable you are as a business but this work here by um chris clark and brian scanlon of um Nevigal associates it, it shows that this reality it isn't true for for farming um because once you reach a point, this this X on the graph, that is where the farm is most profitable. And that is, that point X here is where you take advantage of the natural carrying capacity of the land, if you like. And what happens then, if you try and sort of farm beyond that limit, you have to incur vast amounts of sort of what we call corrective variable costs. So that's your sort of fertilizer, feed, um, pesticides perhaps, extra inputs. That means that you're substituting for nature basically on your farm. And those costs increase to an extent that they, it means that you're out of this profit window that is in the middle here, that MSO spot. Hmm. So what we are trying as, as, as a network to promote is, is this model really, uh, and there's around, there's over 100, 150 farms that have been analysed now, and all the data suggests that the kind of the most profitable farming business is, is this sort of MSO approach. And, it, and it, I guess it, it's in terms of, of, of defining what kind of farming practice that looks like. It's kind of akin to sort of agroecological farming, really. So limiting your inputs and taking advantage of, of nature on, on your farm. Um, 
And there's also, uh, if you go too far to the left of that MSO line, and you kind of adopt more of a rewilding approach, um, there, it, that, I guess, means that you're not taking full advantage or maximizing um, the sort of grass or, or, or yields that you can uh, use to produce food on your farm. So, which means that, again, you're not as profitable. Um, and I guess that also brings different kind of stress um, for, for nature and the environment as well. Because, uh, you know, I'm a big believer in that farming and wildlife has a sort of cause existed uh, and developed over, you know, thousands of years. Um, only recently with, with intensification has, have we seen a sort of um, that equilibrium, that balance being disrupted quite a bit. But I think kind of adopting this MSO approach um, goes back to the sort of um, that more sympathetic way of farming. Um, perhaps that our sort of grandfathers and forefathers adopted, but we can, with the technology uh, and the information that we have now, we can we can do so, do that in a more um, in a more targeted and an efficient way. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, it, it does take a bit of time to, to get around it, but the, the, the premise is that sort of um, the the uh, taking advantage of that natural carrying capacity of the land, not exceeding it, and substituting nature with external inputs um, is, is the most profitable way of farming. And also, in doing so, um, sort of nature um, thrives on the farm as well. So habitats um, get restored. There's more breathing space for nature. Um, a lot of our farmers have adopted this approach and, you know, they, they say it does take a bit of guts to, to, to go down that route. Um, because as an industry, I think we've been asked to produce more and more and intensify. Um, and previous policies with heritage payments, etc., has really sort of encouraged that. Um, but many of our farmers are finding, whilst their um, revenue decreases, their profit margin increases um, because reduced costs and but you know profit per animal increases so it it makes for a more resilient farming business um and with, with prices as they are now with with fertilizer around thousand pounds a ton um i think kind of it, it makes sense to sort of to look at this approach i, I was talking to a, a, a an organic dairy farmer the other day about fertilizer costs and he, he said he has he hasn't he hasn't looked at fertilizer costs in, in 20 years so it sort of doesn't doesn't affect him at all. So um, I think it's, it's, it's a good place to be, um, in my opinion. So um, yeah, that, that, that is it for, for my presentation, Andrew. Um, hopefully uh, you, you all enjoyed um, and it made sense, but I'll, um, I'm, yeah, uh, if you've got any questions, uh, I guess we'll- Okay, that's, the end, yeah? that's great, Rhys. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, there's been a couple of questions um, popped up in the chat, but I think we'll deal with all the questions um, <clears throat> after the presentations are, are done. So uh, if we could now go over to Richard. Um, are you unmuted, Richard? Yes, I think you are. I believe so. Yes. OK, so if you'd like to start sharing your screen and tell us about brown hair streaks. Okay, good evening everybody. Um, this is a solitary story I think, um, but we're not sure what it tells us, but it could tell us quite a number of things. Some are almost in the cat category of the bleeding obvious, and some are probably a little bit more subtle, and the subtle ones are the most difficult to quantify. So that, that's my kind of health warning about this talk. Um, brown hair streak butterfly is a cracking little species that flies very late in the summer and spends most of its life in treetops in the canopy looking for members of the opposite sex in order to prolong itself. 
um, but it does have the need uh, once the female is mated to yeah, yeah, to uh, come down from the treetops uh, to lay its eggs on young blackthorn shoots. And as you can imagine, young blackthorn shoots are something that quite a lot of farmers don't particularly want. Uh, they can be regarded as invasive. And uh, there is an incompatibility with quite a lot of modern hedgerow management um, methods. So just very quickly, tree canopy species seldom seen as an adult butterfly. Now, if you think about that, what that actually means is you won't see one. OK, so the only way you're going to find out where they are and where they breed is looking for those eggs because they lay their eggs mostly in September into the week of October. And once the leaves come off the blackthorn, the young blackthorn, uh, assuming it's not yet flailed, then you should be able to spot the eggs. And uh, I'll show you a couple of photographs in a minute. Um, so the, how we know where this butterfly is distributed is by um, egg surveys um, in the winter. So it is an egg as its life stage from September to April. Um, and its main problem in the modern agricultural environment, but not so much in the environment of smallholders, which I'll mention again in a few minutes, um, is that uh, the annual mechanical flailing of hedges can lose up to 80% of those eggs because they're laid on the young outermost growth, which the flail mm. thrashes off first of all. Um, the populations can spread over several kilometers from what are called assembly trees. Uh, no need to dwell too much on that, but assembly trees sometimes are ash trees. Uh, quite often they're mature oak trees and it's a, a uh, behavior that the butterfly has developed whereby there is a kind of, they used to call a master tree, now we call them assembly trees, where if you imagine all the butterflies hatching out from the chrysalis in August, uh, how do they find each other? They find the assembly tree and that's where they will live and they will mate. So assembly trees can be quite an important part of the overall ecology of the species. And hedgerow trees maybe are not quite as popular as they used to be in a landscape generally. Uh, we all know about the modern um, tendency uh, in the shape of climate change, I think, um, which is for gales and storms at unusual times of year over the last few years, like September, when these butterflies are trying to hang on for dear life in the top of a tree and that it's blowing a hoolie. So there may be an element of um, uh, impact from climate change. Um, the other classic input from climate change effects in the UK and Western Europe is a tendency for a distribution or range of a particular species of insect in particular, uh, because they're warmth loving, they tend to move in a southeast to northwest direction, uh, which often involves an increase in altitude because <clears throat> the isotherms change position. So whatever their ideal temperature is will shift within their landscape. Um, not a very close up view here, but if you can see where I put my cursor, there's two little pinhead, white pinheads, which are brown hair, hair streak eggs. Uh, these are in probably October, November, uh, before the leaves have fallen off the blackthorn. But that's a classic position for the eggs to be laid on the young growth. So this is probably first and second year growth, second year the main stem, and probably. Uh, a new shoot in the last year has come off the side. Um, 
highly magnified, they can look a little bit like sea urchins uh, for what that is worth. There's a group of three there. And occasionally, and this is something we have started to notice more recently, although personally, I'm not convinced that it is a big factor. You do get what is on the left is an intact egg. This is possibly in February, March. Um, and next to it is an egg that has hatched or been predated by a bird. Now, usually the hatched eggs only have a small exit hole. Um, so this one has possibly been predated either by a bird or a parasitic small insect. <clears throat> so hopefully this bit of the presentation will work because it's kind of almost moving pictures. <clears throat> this is a brown hair streak uh, butterfly reserve in Worcestershire, which is another uh, one of its strongholds within the UK. And uh, this is a classic sort of scrubby edge woodland blending into a meadow. And then if hopefully this will work, as I say, there's a couple of eggs there on the blackthorn. Um, sorry about the blank screen, but highly magnified. Somebody from Worcestershire captured this video. Can you see coming out of that egg is a millimeter or two long caterpillar with a black head. <laughs> and it will pop out. Uh, now you can see that the fresh leaves on the blackthorn, the bun filled, usually the leaves come after the flowers with blackthorn, not always, depends on location and subspecies and all sorts of things. Um, and that caterpillar will crawl away, uh, tiny as it is, and we'll go and start feeding on one of these fresh unfurled leaves. So that's what will be happening within the next three or four weeks, really, that will be starting to happen. The eggs hatch in the middle of April. Um, I only put this in because the particular location in the Worcester area, they managed to get the story on the arches. So occasionally, if I knock on people's doors in Carmarthenshire and I say about Brown Hare Street, they say, oh, that's been on the archers. Um, so possibly good publicity. And then you can surprise them by saying, and they should be in the fields around here as well. Uh, this is a farm, as you can see from the caption, right next to the Botanic Gardens a few years ago now. Um, but this particular dairy uh, farmer, the tenant dairy farmer, for whatever reason, um, flailed his hedges uh, every year, but complained bitterly about how much money he lost um, operating the dairy farm. So I'd love to know um, what it is that keeps um, um, some dairy farmers flailing the hedges. If it was sheep, I could understand it because bramble is a problem where sheep get stuck. I, I'd love to know what it is with um, dairy cows. So. Um, and this is a sort of ideal hedge. I don't know whether this is a nature friendly farming network typical hedge. I doubt that it's quite that extreme. <laughs> this is really overgrown, but there's so much young blackthorn growth there that we can rummage about and find a lot of the eggs. And these are two of our uh, one member of staff and a volunteer actually searching the ideal sort of blackthorn suckering in a, in a rough um, low intensity grazed field. Um, so what the brown hair streak needs really is, uh, first of all, it needs to be living at less than 160 metres. That's the classic from the uh, 1980s, 1990s um, records from across Wales. It's only found in southwest Wales. I'll show you a map in a minute. Um, but now, in 2021-2, it seems to be restricted to altitudes of less than 80 metres, with a few exceptions. So it needs unflailed young blackthorn shoots uh, from August right through to the following July, ideally. 
so woodland or wooded valleys nearby, uh, young blackthorn, blah, 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 sunny and sheltered places. Um, I won't dwell too long on this. I'm conscious of the time and need to get the main message across. So um, the beauty of small holders, and hopefully after this evening, we'll also hear a bit more about nature friendly farming uh, uh, operations, but smallholders have a tendency to leave the hedges and the scrub is only lightly managed. They don't have to make a living out of the land. They can't afford the machinery themselves. And if a contractor calls, uh, the way contractors operate, it tends to not always be overtly agreed. It tends to be kind of, well, the gate was open, so I thought you'd want your hedge cut. Um, so it's all very loose and random in many ways. So the message to um, smallholders, and I think mo most of you smallholders out there are doing a cracking job of it, um, try and keep the flail operators away. Um, roadside hedges is fair game because you've got a duty from a safety point of view to make sure your hedges are not overhanging. Um, but hedges between fields uh, don't need to be flailed annually. The problem is once they get flailed annually, um, they look neat and tidy if that's what appeals to you, but they don't do anything for wildlife that I can readily detect. Um, and just to add there that butterfly conservation through our South Wales branch can to a limited extent, help with practical tasks like coppice in old leggy blackthorn. So you've got an old um, thicket that might be good for bullfinches, but has gone beyond for most other things. You want to gradually rejuvenate it over the years. We might be able to help or show you how to do it. Um, this is what we need to avoid. This is a hedge that's flailed every year and really tightly and quite, quite, um, understand why, but um, that's fairly typical of our countryside and has become more and more so, unfortunately. So this is a distribution of brown hair street butterfly and it's quite a useful indicator species of um, hedgerow conditions. Um, we're still trying to get more data on this, but there's some indications that in its um, occurrence within England that it's doing okay, although we haven't got precise enough data to show how it's doing on farmland as opposed to uh, parkland and urban fringe. Um, so that's something that we as an organisation are looking at more at the moment. But within Wales, that is a distribution a few years ago, In it's all in the three counties of South West Wales. Um, I'll skip that because that's just some work we did on management and managing sites ourselves and comparing them to average farmland. Um, the message was fairly clear, but I won't bore you with the figures. Um, this slide shows, uh, it's in slightly the wrong order, but shows one of the worst areas for decline of this butterfly, that's the 10 kilometre squares between uh, Pontagothy and basically Clinderwin, Clinderwin, um, where it's a lot of intensive and dairy farming and a lot of flailing goes on and all those uh, stars are old previous year's records and the blue edges of these 10 kilometer squares are where the butterfly now does still occur. So there's been a big disaster in terms of this butterfly's uh, uh, existence in that particular area. And just to paint the bigger picture for South Wales, you can see here we have the blue squares of open squares with a white background are the um, 10 kilometre squares where there were brown hair street records uh, in the decade up to 2009. And the ones that are filled with solid light blue are the ones where it still remains in the decade from 2009 to 2019. Now, in case you're wondering, well, maybe this is based on the limited number of records we collect uh, records of thousands of eggs every year and we monitor 
set sites uh, and set positions within the historical range so we can detect early any trends and any losses. So it's not just a question of uh, under recording. And I won't bore you with all the uh, details there, but you can see all the sites in Carmarthenshire that we actually monitored regularly, mostly annually, if not biannually. Um, the ones highlighted in yellow highlighting have now disappeared. Uh, they have been lost, which is a bit worrying, really. Um, and what you can possibly work out is the Tavy Valley, where Kevin Leclerc and Penfunnen and Landasil Pontuelli. <coughs> um, the sites are doing okay. They're just hanging on around Broad Oak and Taliaris in the Tawi Valley. Um, and we have just discovered a larger population than we thought we had around Land Ilo, which will be uh, the Carmarthenshire Nature Partnership is meeting at Deneva tomorrow to have a look at those. Um, so that was the area we tried to focus our attention on recently and with some success. And we have now found a lot more butterfly records in this area. I'm sort of pointing out with the cursor. Um, Probably half of them were on the dual carriage, uh, sorry, on the A40 Verge. Uh, and Sutra, South Wales Trunk Road Agency, have been really helpful with their management regime so that everything isn't cut back every year, as long as it's kept back from the road edge. Um, we have this scheme, and somebody contacted me via our office to say they just bought some land that's got one of these on the fence. Um, these are discs which are available if you want to send the message out to your neighbours, fellow villagers, other farms, uh, contractors who might think otherwise, that you're, you're in favour of butterfly-friendly hedges, so you may be, if it's a good thorn hedge, might want it to manage once every four years. It should be perfectly adequate rather than flailed annually. And if you want something a bit more explicit, we have these um, um, labels that we can kind of print off on, say, an A4 poster. And you can put it on your gate where the contractor will otherwise possibly get into your field and help himself to uh, the um, flailing. Um, you can go out and have a look if you feel so inclined for some of these eggs yourself. We've just come into the end of the season this year. Um, and, um, oh, you can join our, sorry, go back. Um, you can join our gang of friendly volunteers that go out once a week and, and do occasionally end up in cafes and what have you. Um, this is uh, an example on a one kilometer square basis of how the decline has manifested itself. So only the black, solid black one kilometer squares are currently occupied in the last five years <clears throat> and all the rest is history. So it's about a 50 to 60% decline over the last 10 years. And that's another way of showing it in terms of the <clears throat> the metro population, the landscape area. And just incidentally, we did flag up this problem with the Welsh Government at their request in 2008 um, and um, made the point that it did need to enforce a little less flailing. And um, I think about three weeks ago, we had an apology from the Welsh Government 13 years later that they hadn't actually replied in the meantime, we have kind of suffered this catastrophic decline. It's not all over yet because the Tavy Valley um, is different to the Towy Valley and naturally more difficult to farm intensively. And that may be one of the reasons why they've done a lot better there. So that's me, I'll shut up. I hope I haven't been too much over my time. Okay, thank you very much. Richard, that's fascinating. There are a couple of questions in the chat for you, but we'll come to those uh, after we've heard from Malcolm. So if you'd like to stop sharing your screen, uh, Richard. Yep. 
and uh, we'll go over to Mal. So, hiya. I'm uh, Malcolm Edwards, and I'm a um, contractor working in Carmarthenshire, but I go as far as Gower and Pems and into Mid Wales as well, um, as well as Glamorgan. Um, so I've been hedgling as a contractor for probably about 20 years now, um, as well as managing um, 30 acres of my own um, land for conservation, uh, working coppice, um, ancient woodland, and um, well, generally trying to manage uh, a piece of land that was part of an estate um, purely for conservation, but also to try and sustain myself and my, my family. So um, over the past 20 years, it's been, no, it's quite, it's been quite noticeable really that uh, hedge laying has been something that has been in, in real need. So conservation of um, heritage craft, as well as the, the practice of hedge laying for sustainable farming and regenerative practice has been something that has really grabbed me. So it's, it's, it seems to have become something that's kind of my calling, if you like. Um, so um, I've had the opportunity to, to work with a few um, very seasoned hedge layers. You know, some of some have had sixty years work, uh, sixty years on the craft, um, and that includes dry stone walling, cloth work, planting, um, different regional knowledge on the styles. Um, you know, some of the farmers I worked for are very like standard farmers, but they still recognize the the importance of their their kind of predecessors' craft. So, so a lot of them have learned from their great grandfathers and it's you know come to come to them. So um you know inspiring inspiring people really and um you know some some will lay a hedge and then it's gonna get tractor mounted flail for the rest of its life and then other hedge layers I've met will lay a hedge and then trim the sides very lightly and then grow on the top. So, you know, there's, there's different viewpoints in the practice. Um, some of the farmers I work with, um, the pasture is more important to them than the hedgerows. But, you know, they don't flail twice a year. They flail, one, flail once a year, um, late in the winter, if it's, if, it's dry, if it's dry and hard, and then they'll, they'll grow on. So, I mean, I know there's a massive discussion and a, a about flail management and hedge laying, and I think it's quite, it's difficult for any farmer to realistically hedge lay a thousand acre farm and not have to have some mechanised practice to keep some of the some of the hedgerows under control. But I really think you know with the experience, and I'm sorry I'm going on to this quite early, but it's, it seems to be quite current with the past two speakers. Yeah, um, I think it's quite important that um, at a higher level, people who are the craft, the craftsmen and women practicing in hedge laying, the conservation specialists and the naturalists need to get maybe through you know maybe through NF um, NFFN need to get to a higher level for, so, that, so that these things are recognized within the farming practice. Um, maybe that's a conference in itself, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, anyway, so um, hedge laying has become something that's, like I said, my calling. Um, and I've had the opportunity to work at St. Fagans, um, promoting the heritage craft in front of the Taliaris building. Um, I was part of a team of people that ran Kamal Lynch's first hedge laying contest this year, or sorry, October. And through doing that, I recognized that hedge laying pre-industrial revolution was one of the practices that groups of farmers used to get together to do. So we'd work, you know, we'd be working around different farms together. The hedge laying contest was a real inspiration for me in that sense, because farmers had been locked up for two years. Some of the elderly farmers I'd met before through doing footpaths and stuff. And we had 10, 15 farmers just leaning on Land Rovers, watching, watching men and women hedge lay and practice their best, their best work. But um, so anyway, the contest was to raise money for two charities that were to prevent, uh, were supporting the prevention of suicide in farming. So for me, hand in hand, the craft, these kind of heritage crafts within the farming community and the social element of that 
became well obviously it's been something that's been on my mind for a long time but the contest meant that it kind of brought it to the fore so i know that nature sustainability and the production of good food for us is important but also is it's the well-being of the people that work the land so what we're talking you know what i'm talking about is the you know i think there's a definite connection between what we how we work our land and how our well-being is um is within that so anyway um through working through working my own land my own coppice i produce all of my own um all of my own stakes and bindings for my different styles of hedge laying so um for 20 years i've worked um a coppice that was part of originally part of the dead with estate so i don't know if anyone in kamalich is familiar with that so um, we were fortunate enough to have the opportunity to buy these two, these parcels of land, which had had quite minimal uh, minimal work, but it meant um, I was restoring historic historic coppice that was originally sustaining the dead estate. So the production of I guess tool handles, hurdles, um, charcoal, firewood, um, it was all quite valid. And in restoring the coppice, I've now got to a state standard where some of my coops produce um, quality stakes and bindings, and which other hedge layers from different parts of Wales come and get from me. So, I mean, for, I feel very fortunate really to be in a position where um, craftsmen and women are approaching me for my, for my stakes and bindings, because um, through managing a piece of land, a piece of woodland sustainably i'm now supporting other heritage craftsmen and women around throughout wales so i um i practice a few different styles of hedge laying um the stakes and bindings are primarily for uh brecknock radnisher style hedge laying which involves um stakes uh, laid at an angle against the pleachers so if people are familiar with the the language i'll explain that in a little bit so um Brecken uses stakes and bindings. The bindings lock the stakes together. Um, I also practice um, Gower, Gower hedge laying, which is, um, is known as a flying hedge, which ordinarily sits on a bank. Um, the finished material, once it's laid, is then at stock proof height. Um, so it's very similar to Pembrokeshire, um, Pembrokeshire and Devon, interestingly, which are coastal regions. Um, but I also then practice a few different types of what are, what's called crop and pleach, which is seen more often throughout Carmarthenshire, up into Mid Wales, uh, Mary on Niv, um, North Wales. There's, there's a few different regional styles of that. I mean, it's a subject I could really go on about, really, because I'm a bit of a nerd about it. But um, but anyways, um, so the crop and pleach really uses all of the material that comes out of the hedge. So in in the practice, um, when I've laid, when I've worked with landowners, a lot of them will show me an area that perhaps their father or their grandfather had worked on. So <clears throat> I've been lucky enough to have the opportunity to really stand in someone else's footsteps and see their work, and then use the hedge to replicate the work that was once done there before. So I think one of the amazing things about hedges is really that um, even though some of the documents I've seen have, set, have shown that um, good hedge layers have, have been on the decline since the 1700s, and then you've got uh, you know we've got the Napoleonic Wars of the 1800s, and then you've got um, coming to the 1800s you've got bigger industrial need for you know so a lot of agricultural workers move into the cities away from the countryside then you've got a flu pandemic you've got two world wars and mechanized farming widespread and we're in a position where we're seeing dwindling hedgerows dwindling wildlife lack of skill in the countryside to promote the the crafts that were once deeply rooted in in welsh farming and we have a climate crisis so I'm I'm really interested in the the 
the work that is left on the farms, the the original work that you see on the hedge banks or you see, you know, the, if you like, field archaeology that's left behind. So um, that's a, a fascinating subject for me, really. And I've been, been fortunate enough to see some really, really old work that potentially could be dated to 200 plus years, you know, um, and really good examples across Gower, Carmarthenshire and up into Mid Wales as well. There's one of one of my inspiring, it's really it's quite an inspiring thing for me. But um, so I'm not really the, I'm not really your ordinary contractor. Um, I mean, I do I do standard agricultural fencing and gate hanging and off season work, but my hedge laying season begins in September, pretty much when the when the first hedge laying contest happens on Gower, and and then it finishes pretty much the end of March. But what I'm saying is I'm not really your ordinary contractor in that a lot of fencing contractors on farms will, will say they do hedge laying, but a lot of it is just cutting stuff. You know, they're not interested in leaving clean cuts that heal. They're interested in getting their meterage done. So if we, you know, we're, if it was to, a chance to talk to um, Nature Friendly Farming Network about right practice in hedge laying and the opportunity to speak to naturalists and specialists in their field we, we should get together to discuss right practice um things that will work for um nature but will also work for the farmers too so we need it we need to try and get together and discuss that somehow so anyways um so when i work I, back to being not your ordinary contractor um, so when it comes to hedge laying, fortunately, I think a lot of people approach me who are already conservation minded and, you know, still get contract. I still get asked to do contracts for farmers that will want to lay hedges like in mid April and things like that. And I just, I'm not flat. I'm not going to be doing that. But, um, as I said, my season is specific and I stick to those rules because of nesting birds and, you know, I'm not interested in the destructive practice of intensive that you know um inconsiderate practice so anyway i'm not your ordinary contractor in that um i advise people after the after i've laid hedges for them i advise them to just lightly clip the sides of the hedge and grow the hedge on so it can be laid again which isn't your ordinary viewpoint i think um <clears throat> i'm interested in leaving a legacy but also giving more people the opportunity to hedge lay themselves. So um, I've been part, fortunate to be part, fortunate enough to be part of a project um, called Gower Hedgerow Hub, which ran for seven years with some subsidy from Europe. Um, and we would we were training um, people to head, hedge lay with hand tools, <clears throat> which gave them the experience to then lay with chainsaws if they had. And if they were had if they were qualified um we worked with volunteers we planned i think we laid one one season in i think 2017 i think we laid maybe a thousand like 1500 meters a hedge and planted nearly 2000 meters with groups of volunteers um so you know that was great we you know the legacy of that work with volunteers is there to this day and it'll be there for 100 plus years to come so um, Gower Hedgerow Hub, it's been brilliant. Um, the other project, which um, has just finished, and I was lucky enough to train um, two apprentices, was uh, the Dufferin Towie project, which came out of the Botanic Gardens, which um, if you look online, there's some quite good information about that. Um, the two young, young men that worked with me <clears throat> ended up, one of them ended up with full-time job involved in flood defense. Because obviously he was hedge laying with me. Flood defence is quite high on the agenda when it comes to hedges, um, as well as um, carbon sink. There's lots, you know, it's diverse. So anyway, he he got he was involved in flood defence with um, the local authority. But then the other young man, Oshan, he's been really fortunate. He's now working for an estate doing dry store walling in the off season, and he's getting work hedge laying from me so 
I've been lucky. I've been lucky in that I've had good mentors, and it's for I feel fortunate enough to be able to pass that that craft on as well. So um, you know, all going well, be carrying on carrying that on. But I think I might be ending up I might end up moving on to an electric chainsaw. So you know, you know, this is this is this is one of the things that's for, that we're fortunate now with good technology. Um, I get jobs. Some of the jobs I get given are massive, overstood hawthorns that need very, very subtle care to be able to lay them back to where they once were. I mean, their original work is still at the heel of them, but you know, with with good with a good saw, with good knowledge and good practice, old hedgerows which I've seen many get destroyed and ripped up due to storms coming through. They can be restored back to their original state, which, you know, as we all know, intensive flailing twice a year means that you end up having meters and meters of hedge that just look like bottle brushes. And that's not right. So with right practice, I think we can restore overstood hedgerows, um, intensively flailed hedgerows and um, just general poor management. So, um yeah, that's that's pretty much where I'm coming from with it. Um, but yeah, let's you know, let's hope that um, with groups like this and Kamala and Meadows, then we can try and get together and and actually share right practice because not everybody understands what it takes to lay good hedges or what their own heritage craft is, you know, or what the significance of intensive flailing or or you know flailing say once in May and once in September. If they, People don't know the rep, they don't, they, you know, they're engaged in trying to survive on their own land. The practice may not have been shared with them. You know, I think edu it's about education, you know what I mean? And that comes, that's right through, right through from educating volunteers about it, right through to having the opportunity, opportunity to work with farmers. So that's me. Okay, thank you very much, Mel. And uh, here's an opportunity for you, Richard and Reese, to now you've all met each other, if only on a screen, I think you could help each other out with this. Um, there, there's quite a few questions um, in the chat, but just before that, um, I've got a question for you, uh, Mel. Yeah. You were saying about how after the hedge is laid, yeah. you tend to sort of just trim the sides a bit, let it grow up until it needs laying again. Oh, yeah. uh, on our place, we've got mostly hazel, blackthorn and hawthorn in the hedges. How yeah. I have laid some of it and I'd hate for you ever to see it because it's done in such an amateurish, untidy way. But There's a formula. There's a formula <laughs> to it. There is. How how many years would you say it will be before it needs doing again? I think seven years optimum. Yeah, yeah, seven years is pretty pretty good because that's you can lay it with hand tools then. Yeah, but you know if that's like a short rotation coppice basically, you know. Okay. Yeah, short rotation coppice. The other thing I sorry I forgot to mention as well because we discussed standards in hedgerows. I think Richard mentioned it. Um, yes. And the lack of standards in hedgerows. So one of the other things I promote is that standards are left at 30 meter spacings. Yeah. So if a, if a overstood hedgerow is a neglected overstood hedgerow is in is needs management, coppicing, laying, coppicing, and laying, I'll choose a standard which is a good specimen to leave in that hedge line. And that's one of the other things that I promote in my practice. So that could be a thought a hawthorn. It could be a good specimen oak. It could be a beech. It could be, well, it has been in the past a decent ash, but they're getting fewer and fewer in the head. Um, yeah, so that, with that set, like seven-year rotation and standards at 30-meter spacings, you don't shade out the work. You don't shade out any of the edge because the spacing is right. So, you know, I think seven years is optimum myself. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thanks for thanks for that. Um, I'll I'm just looking through the chat um, to see if there's uh, some questions for Reese. Uh, yeah. Um, at 
the moment there's big increases in the cost of living you know everything's getting expensive people are struggling to make ends meet um food produced at high environmental standards has often got a price premium on it you know you um you pay more because you care about how it was produced um how do you think that uh, that might affect your members and nature friendly farming and you've got to unmute yourself before you can answer that <laughs> that's it um I, I guess it, it's it's trying to mainstream sort of nature friendly farming. I guess at, at the moment, perhaps it's it's viewed uh, as a niche, um, you know, sort of get, getting a premium for for producing something of high environmental standard. That you know that that should be the norm, really, shouldn't it? Um, you should you shouldn't have to label something. Um, to show that it that it you know good animal welfare, good you know sort of benefiting yeah. nature and the environment, it, that should be the norm in itself. And you know if almost it should it should reverse it. If something is damaging, that should be labelled. So I think there's there's yeah. that kind of uh, shift in mentality and sort of marketing that that, that needs to change there. Um, yes. Yeah. I, I in terms of yeah how it affects members. Um, I mean, everyone has, has a different approach to, you know, to food production, don't they? So, you know, can sell direct to markets, uh, to supermarkets, you know, to, direct to, to abattoirs. Uh, we, we, we do need that mixture. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I would say, that, yeah, we, we need to turn that on its head, make nature friendly farming the norm so that we, so that we don't, you know, we don't, we don't have to promote it as something that is, that is, uh, that is, better than, than sort of everything else sort of thing um but i think in in order to in order to do that i think kind of farming that the industry needs i think it needs support um to to farm in a more nature friendly way um and the, the the point i was making around sort of agricultural policies it needs to it needs to drive that nature friendly farming approach yeah. because i think land use policy agricultural policy is such a big driver of how land is managed on the ground we, we see it so with heritage payments um, encouraging more stock you know uh, and and the degradation of habitats along with that we see now with with the sort of basic payment scheme where there's undergrazing there's you know sort of land abandonment is becoming an issue potentially as a result of that as it's because it's easier not to farm it and just claim the the, the area based payment. So if we can get the policy right, um, we you know we can really kind of take a huge step towards mainstreaming nature friendly farming in Wales. Yeah, that's very good. Thank you. It, it, essentially, farmers do what the government wants them to do. The the government policies and the way the farmers are paid will decide what they do so the big changes before and after the second world war is purely a result of what the government wanted the farmers to do okay uh qu question from richard for you what is nffn's attitude to hedgerow management that's really <laughs> something that we'll be developing after this meeting maybe yeah um, well, i mean we, we don't have a an official NFFN um, policy on on hedge funding, but sort of yeah, kind of really uh, endorse and advocate what you know Mal and, and, and Richard were talking about there. And um, yeah, what one thing I I, I don't understand is, is the is that sort of the the nicely trimmed square hedge and, and you know a lot of farmers are, are really proud proud of that you know the the the, the tidy uh, look. Um, but as you say, it's it's not the best um, thing for, for wildlife. So, you know, kind of encourage rotational uh, management and cutting. Um, let, you know, let your hedge grow a bit, a bit thicker. Um, and not, not just management, but sort of hedge and creation as well. You know, you, you kind of, I don't know, it, it, sometimes it disheartens me. I'm, I'm driving around, you know, kind of uh, the Welsh countryside. And every time I see just a, a single 
fence as a boundary you know it, it's a missed opportunity you know, to, yeah. you know that, that could be a, a wildlife friendly uh, boundary in the form form of, of a hedge or, or trees or whatever um, and I think schemes in general need to needs to reward and, and, and sort of facilitate farmers to to, to establish those hedges because it, it is not cheap um, you know there's I think farmers in general you know, focusing so much on, on the farming side of things, and that in itself uh, is time-consuming and stressful. You know, the sort of the last thing someone might want to do is plant a hedge because they've got no time and, and it's expensive. Uh, but we we are very fortunate um, on the farm at the moment. We're working with ten of the farmers uh, along the Union catchment, working with Snowdonia um, National Park Authority on a natural flood defence scheme. So. We planted two kilometres of uh, hedgerows uh, over the last year, um, and you know we, we've been involved in agri environment schemes since you know the, the early nineties when they were introduced, and we planted more trees in the last year than we have in the sort of past thirty years. Um, so it does tell you a, a bit, I think, about sort of um, current agri environment schemes and how how they can uh, better facilitate and reward farmers to. To, to plant uh, plant hedgerows. Okay, can I just say yeah, thanks to Richard and Mal for the, for those talks. And Mal, your sort of uh, enthusiasm is um, it's contagious. You know, it's really 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 good to hear. So yeah, it may be in in, in seven eight or nine years time when when our when our two kilometres of of hedgerows are established, maybe I'll, I'll give you a call to yeah. <laughs> Okay, there's a question here from Rachel to Richard. Um, are there any plans for introductions into areas now appearing to suit the hair streak, brown hair streak? Richard? Yeah, I, I did reply to Rachel in the chat, actually, but so uh, it, it's quite interesting because there's always a temptation to uh, get some publicity with the the press by introducing things, it'd be much better if we didn't lose them in the first place, um, which is down to um, careful management, as I think we've all been saying this evening. Um, uh, there was an example, which is not a million miles from where Rachel is, uh, of a, um, a farm which is run as a conservation farm. It's over 100 acres, sorry, over 100 hectares. Um, and um, they are stuffed with 15 foot wide blackthorn hedges. It had been long neglected beforehand. It was stuffed full of brown hair streaks. The whole little valley had over a thousand brown hair streak eggs and took us volunteers best part of two years to uh, actually count them all. Anyway, that's by the by. Um, despite all our wonderful management with the full support of the uh, owners, um, all the surrounding farms gradually um, had their hedges flail more and more frequently and it, the species still disappeared. Um, th there could obviously be other factors at work, but I mean, in simple terms, and I do like to keep things down to earth and simple, um, if every time as a flail passes, you lose 80% of the young growth with the eggs on of this particular species, uh, each year that 80% is going to be 80% of a smaller number and uh, two or three years they'll be extinct. So we have to work with areas where topography and man management and landscape and culture are on our side. The ideal place, that, interestingly, the signs at the moment are that the uh, the population is doing much better in its extreme northwest of its range, which is basically Cardigan. If you keep going further northwest from Cardigan, you will eventually get very wet and slightly salty. And um, so that would be the ideal place if there was some land there that was low lying and we and had some blackthorn on it. But uh, alas, that's not the case. But, <laughs> There is, um, I think the most important thing is to try and get networks of local farmers, smallholders, landowners generally, all sorts of uh, 
I don't, don't mean this in a derogatory sense, unlikely people seem to acquire fields for all sorts of multifarious purposes. Um, get them all together over a big area, at least a couple of square miles, and get them all thinking alike. And that's one of the things that um, with um, um, Claire, who's um, one of our staff in butterfly conservation, we're trying to find some way forward. And the Duffing Toey project, which Mel mentioned, and uh, sorry, I missed your two um, 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 apprentices because they're already fully occupied with you. We, they were hoping to come out with us. Um, yeah. We really put in some recommendations to um, uh, I can't remember the lady who runs the scheme that uh, it would be good to get some farmers together in local areas to work together and be part of the project. Unfortunately, it does seem like the project has wound down significantly, which I haven't realised, but we'll keep plugging away in other means via the Commandment Nature Partnership, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, so. uh, yeah, comment from Rhys. Uh, are you working with farmers on any projects to help manage for this species and i know he's got quite a few members in carmarthenshire so yeah uh, maybe he can point you in their direction yes that would be fantastic because uh, we, we we are working with at least a dozen in carmarthenshire and some small holders uh, well within the dozen probably half a small holders half a yeah. farm um but uh, that's not to say we know everybody it's a hell of a big place <laughs> So, yeah, I'd love the opportunity to uh, have a chat with you and see if we can uh, get some ideas together on that one. Good. Right. Question here for Mal. Uh, do you think hedge laying is becoming a lost art or skill amongst farmers? Is it now more of a skill undertaken by specialised contractors? Yeah, in a, in a sense, yes. Um, I, I primarily because I don't think most farmers have got the time anymore. Mm. And um, I know it's, there's only a few young farmers societies that still will run a course. I mean, I think Breck, not Radnish is not, not one of those because they run hedge contests and things as well. I mean, there's, they're not, there aren't a lot of hedge layers about. I mean, there's one, there was one chap local to me, Trevor Davis, and he's eight, He's just short of 80. He's, he's about to retire. Yeah. He's still hedge laying, but he cherry picks work now. But you, you know, you are, you know, as a hedge layer and one that's sought after, you are one of only a few that are about. So, I mean, that's why I've been trying to work really with promoting the, the craft itself, you know, by whatever means I can. Um, but yeah, I think it's not, it's not quite, it's not quite dwindling yet, but it has the potential to. Definitely. So we've all, I think we've all got a responsibility really to, to try and find, I mean, the, if people could join the National Hedge Layers um, Society, um, they run a really good, uh, re, they run really good events. Um, obviously Prince Charles is behind the craft as well because he likes to hedge lay in his spare time as well. But um, I mean, the society, yeah, and there's, there's the possibility of a Welsh National Hedge Laying Society coming about. And I really hope that, you know, if people look into the contests that happen, there's a Glamorgan Hedgley and match, there's a Gower Hedgley and match. Well, um, next year, we'll have our second Kamalinja Hedgley and match. I mean, the more people that come to those and support those, the more contractors you can meet. You know, you can meet other Hedgleyers, you like that person's work, you just, you know, invite them about. But it's, I think it's too hard for people to think that it's dwindling when they don't they don't go and yeah. see the contest you know it's yeah. it's still alive but it has the potential to to fail you know if yeah. mechanized if everything becomes mechanized now like there's new bits of equipment now they will actually lay a mechanized hedge and clamp it down and they're out there so they, i think they're being used in different parts of europe already good i mean the, the potential for that to happen is there <laughs> and i don't think it's a good thing well there's a comment here from stella uh, could there be an annual Carmarthenshire hedge laying and woodcraft festival with demonstration of heritage crafts? Well, I think what oh, you were great. saying, there's that sort of on the cards, isn't it? Yeah. So if um, if you can tell Stella to Google uh, or look look for Dufferin Towie hedge laying match, 
and then drop a message in there. Yeah. Okay. Then um, I'd be really interested in that. We're actually looking for a farm, a good farm with roadside hedges and good area to to run something this October. Um, it'll be they will have a young farmers pull as well, so there'll be a, there'll be a tug of war. Um, and the intention is to re, that'll really reach out into the young farming community with the craft as well. Brilliant. So yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. Um, yeah. Question from Roger. How were hedges trimmed in pre-industrial ages? Uh, with a with a scythe or cr a cr what they call him Craman in Wales, right? Yeah, so um, there's a really good black and white film. It's called Hedging, 1942. If you want to YouTube that, it's amazing. It's lush. Um, <laughs> but he's using easy. It's that's in England that is, and he's working with a land girl as well, side by side. But um, yeah, Kraman would have been used to trim up the sides. And it literally right. would have been just trimming the sides. You know, the top would have been left alone. Yeah. So, I mean, there's no reason we can't be following that suit now. Is that tool a thing like a bill hook with a very long handle? It's more like a sickle. All oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Another one from Stella. How would you manage a previously flailed hedge? How long does it need to be left before further intervention? So I think about, how like, long will it take it to yeah? Depends how tall it is. Yeah. I mean, if you if you have a if you have an intense a, a hedge that's been flailed intensively and it's literally five foot, so it's stock proof height, so you know, cow's eyeball type of height, then ideally you could lay it, but it'll be in, it'll be completely flat. So it won't be mm. stock proof. So you, yeah. you'd have to have fenced, you'd have to be fenced either side. But ideally, I'd be leaving something to grow on for two years two seasons okay and then you've got some volume on top then that ties in nicely as you know it's about creating a creating a living heart really and the more volume you have to create that living heart so that the hedge can start back up again you, the better okay there's a comment from roger here um glass deer hedgerow management projects have been disastrous for hedges in our neighborhood on yeah. land Thysant. Mature trees felled to create new hedges. Yeah. So that's not. Yeah, very good. and the other the other issue with that is that they've been disastrous for the contractors as well. Right. Because the glass tier subsidy was paying peanuts, so primarily, like primarily, you're only going to get monkeys then, anyway. So, <laughs> I mean, I think you, it, they, the offices that were overseeing the glass tier project. The left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing, and the officers that came out hadn't really had any experience of farming in the first place. So I mean, okay. it's a big subject in the farming community last year, and it's almost it's almost as dirty a word as rewilded. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but anyway, last year is a bit of a dirty word, yeah. yeah. Uh. Comment here from Emma, an outstanding hedge laid on a large residential garden in Coydley would be great if more private gardens took this up, make hedge laying fashionable. It would help encourage and keep skilled workers employed. Sadly, land owned by the council opposite is flailed. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, local, authority, local authorities can set an example. You know what I mean? If they, yes. You know, they, I think that's... A view of the Future Generations Act. Yes. Councils have to follow that now. It's becoming more and more commonplace. And I think that comes down, that should come down to heritage craft as well. Yeah. You know? I wonder if um, the reason, you know, someone was saying about how proud some farmers are of their sort of square hedges flailed perfectly every year it's there's a sort of tidiness thing and it's similar to road verges often the councils will say if we don't mow all the road verges like lawns people will complain and say that it's not tidy yeah i think that might be an element yeah the thing is a clipped a clipped hedge isn't isn't that bad a thing as long as it's full at the bottom as the whole thing yep. the whole hedge is full i mean it's it, you can't you can't tar everyone with the same brush but like yeah you know a lot of flail hedges have got next to nothing inside them yeah 
after a certain number of years, they just look like a row of mushrooms with just exactly. a stem and a bit of growth at the top. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the time has caught up with this. It's, it's just coming up to nine o'clock. So uh, Reese will put the NFFN website um, link on our website. So uh, people uh, who haven't seen who weren't here this evening also they'll have a chance to watch the recording on our youtube channel so lots of uh, people sending in comments to thank the three of you for your excellent talks and i add my thanks to that thank you very much indeed thank you okay thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. thanks to all okay well yeah. good night everybody then i think we're done thanks Good night.